Uh, thanks everybody for joining again for this second day of Federated Data Architectures. Thanks to Michiel de Jong, our speaker again, for giving these two lectures. The recording and the slides from yesterday are already in the Indico events. And uh, without further delay, I suggest that we give the mic, if it shall, to the speaker as there's cool. material to cover today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have a lot of slides and I love this topic, so I tend to talk long about it. I'll try to, uh, to make it within uh, the time. So um, yeah, second part of federated data architectures. Um, yesterday, we talked about personal data stores and uh, enterprise files, synchronization and sharing uh, systems and how files that are stored on some server get to the place where an application can use them. And um, now I wanted to talk about federated bookkeeping, um, which is a topic that we at uh, Pondasource um, work on. Pondasource is a nonprofit startup, uh, uh, so a post growth startup where we don't take investment, but we uh, do produce technology and all our profits go to open source uh, software and research. So federated bookkeeping is the idea of linking bookkeeping systems together. Uh, and it's sort of the, uh, the other option uh, where money is the first option. Uh, so you interact with other agents in your environment by giving them money and receiving money and um, federated bookkeeping is the other option of, of coordinating this interaction and the value you owe each other, which is, well, say, I keep track of it and you keep track of it. And this is something we do in society already. Uh, and, um, and there are lots of uh, like gift cultures in, um, uh, in, in villages or where people keep track of what they owe each other. That is a form of federated bookkeeping, but we're doing it with computers. So um, the topics uh, that I want to go through are, first I want to talk about money and um, explain a little bit about how um, we, I view it slightly differently from what uh, classic economics uh, says about it. Degrowth, which is the idea that if um, the economy keeps growing, then we would need more than one planet to uh, mine and then what FinTech can do to improve how, um, how money and business works. And then we get to bookkeeping as the answer and e-invoicing, which is electronically sending e invoices, which is sort of the basic form of federated bookkeeping, um, connecting your bookkeeping systems together by saying and the invoice gets uh, sent in a machine readable way instead of having to print it and mail it or to attach your PDF to an email and type it over. Um, logistics, which is more about like, if these bookkeeping systems are tied together, how can we improve how logistics works? And then virtual organizations with better rated bookkeeping, that's sort of the futuristic view of how organizations could work um, without relying on investment and money as the basis of organization, but just using federated bookkeeping as the primary basis of organization. So talking about money, it's obviously a topic we all um, like and whether um, there's always a, I guess, uh, even if you're um, as an anti-capitalist, there's still a fascination with like all this potential that money has like, oh, if I were a rich person, uh, what couldn't I do? Like swim in my coins, like um, Scrooge McDuck, he's, he's called in, the, in English, I think. And um, we have always, uh, or classically, economists have defined money as something that rational agents use. And rational agents in multi-agent theory are agents that are, that are selfish. They only um, uh, look at what they, uh, they optimize their own uh, profit and they're never altruistic unless they can get something out of it for themselves again. Um, and this is of course a model that uh, does work quite well even if agents aren't behaving entirely selfishly because 
you could always translate the altruistic behavior by um, uh, translate it to what's in it for um, the altruist. And um, one of the things that is obvious why you would do something that makes another person happy or another agent in your multi-agent network, why you would try to make them happy is well, maybe they pay you for it in an anonymizing um, currency. So first, uh, Alice makes Bob happy by doing something, then Bob owes Alice favor, but that's that favor is, um, uh, it might not be relevant if Bob and Alice meet uh, repeatedly, then that favor has value for a rational agent. But if um, she's only meeting Bob once, just for this one transaction, then for a rational agent, there would be no reason to um, to do something for another agent, uh, except when they pay you for it. And then trans that translates uh, the credit that Alice has with Bob to a credit that Alice has against some anonymous bubble, an anonymous uh, currency. And the way that economists describe the roles of money is um, as a unit of value. So you can measure like this is worth seven uh, units of uh, some currency and a means of exchange. So it's it helps the um, the little ritual that Alice would do like, so either uh, you say, okay, I do this, and then you shake hands, and then you give coins, or even if it's electronic, you say, okay, uh, I'll pay you these seven units. And uh, this little ritual of exchanging the money, whether it's physical movement into possession, or whether it's uh, on paper, um, through some uh, uh, some banknotes, for instance. and that means that is a means for that makes it possible to do this ritual of exchange and store of value uh that's maybe the most uh, important one of you look at it more closely it means that uh you could have a a same day exchange so you'd have could have a three-way barter on the same day where you say uh i'm gonna um, uh busk i'm gonna play a song with my guitar until i have three euros and then I'm going to spend these euros um, in the shop to buy a sandwich. And that means uh, that uh, through the interaction with other agents, um, the shopkeeper uh, might not be interested in my song, but somebody else is interested in my song. And so I'm swapping those. And um, so their money acts as a means of exchange with multiple uh, players. Uh, multilateral exchange or, or, or yeah, multiplayer, multi-agent exchange. Um, but uh, the more interesting case is when if I first uh, say I play my guitar and then I earn money and I just get rich. And then once I have money stored, I can later decide like, oh, today I need this or today I need that. So that, that just, I build up some uh, some money stash that gives me freedom to do other stuff, which I might not know yet. So then there's a connection over time between what I give and what I take, um, even if though they're at different times. And if uh, that's sell, then buy. And of course you can buy, then sell, which is um, also interesting if you just, yeah, you just woke up, so you need a sandwich now. And then once you have eaten, you're able to play the guitar, um, but also, in um, business terms, like means of uh, credit is almost a means of production. Like if you wanna start a company, the first thing you need is investment to even get started. So um, that is also the uh, a role of money that it's, uh, it connects uh, the time it takes to produce something, um, it, it bridges that time gap. Um, so if you look at uh, money for, cooperating agents. So if you don't think about uh, what's in it for me, but you think about a group of agents that are uh, have a common goal. So for instance, together, they want to keep, um, let's say they're socialists. So they say, everybody should have food. We don't want uh, hunger. Uh, we don't want to waste the planet. So we want to keep the environment. Uh, we can change small things on the planet, or we keep it 
intact. And we don't want to do useless work. So um, I want to only do work if it's, uh, if it's useful. And for that, we need coordination. Um, so uh, that is um, how you could also see humanity on this planet. Yeah, we're just a group of people who are the guardians of this, um, this single planet and we need to um, eradicate hunger and, um, uh, and make sure that it all, uh, we all live in peace. And if you view money in that context, then um, the role of money is still very important. So it's, money is not just selfish, it also has a um, important role, even if you assume that we're all on the same team, then um, it throttles consumption. So if you um, would consume too much at some point, your money runs out. And so uh, as long as you have money, so you work a little bit, then you get your salary, then you go to spend your salary. And um, as long as you have money, you are sort of entitled to that consumption. At least that's how we um, organize it in society. And it's um, this is getting less. So nowadays there's, um, I don't see anybody in Utrecht driving uh, a Hummer because you know these really huge cars that are like consume as much gas as five cars because you know you just even if you consume that much then you're just not cool anymore so um it's cool to consume a little bit less but um there still is the idea that uh, you know it's my money and i can spend it how i want and if something's for sale then i'm entitled to buy it if it's not illegal to buy it then i'm entitled to it so um to throttle how much one person consumes uh because obviously it, it one very bad thing that could happen to a team uh, living on a, a team of humans living on a planet is that uh, some people just consume everything and there's nothing left for the other. So to throttle that, we say, well, everybody can consume until their money runs out. And then we know there is a limit to consumption. Um, and another role is to signal demand. So, um, you know, maybe if you're selling tickets for some concert, then uh, if you don't sell any tickets, then apparently you'll have to face the reality that nobody likes your music. And then maybe somebody else is selling lots of tickets because they're the new hype. And uh, maybe the, the concert hall organizer didn't know that, but they see, whoa, these are really selling a lot of tickets. So let's get them to play five more concerts. So by uh, paying money for something, you signal to the producer that you like what they're doing and they, you want them to do more of it. And then for um, group action, of course, if you wanna organize what you do together, um, you can uh, pay each other and uh, split the money that is um, uh, that comes into, a, for instance, a group of producers, so that um, you can, for instance, be an employee of a company, and you know you get your money every month, and um, that is organized, that organizes your participation in this group, and uh, because you know that all the other people are also you know, happy with the money they receive that you get a group that can work as a team without having to worry about uh, how much everybody contributes. So uh, that's sort of a different view of money where it's not about rational agents, it's about a, a, a cooperating team, but you still use money to coordinate your own work. And um, one uh, weird part about it is then still that if you use money in this way, then you are anonymizing uh, the behavior of each group member. So you say, well, okay, anything is allowed as long as you have enough money for it. Uh, and um, you're allowed to be lazy as long as your money doesn't run out. But this is of course not exactly how the group works socially. Um, and so you always get discussions about uh, people who, uh, I don't know, take, um, welfare but don't really try to uh, work for it and uh, the contrast of that with basic income for instance where you would um, just say uh, where you would remove that role of money of as a um, uh, motivation so 
Uh, the next topic I want to, there's a little, this was the part about money. The second part is about degrowth, um, which is a related topic uh, to competition versus cooperation and how money is used to organize humanity on this planet. And um, it's, a, it's a negative definition. So it says what degrowth wants is the opposite of growth. So it doesn't say what it does want, uh, but you could say, well, maybe shrink or stop growing. And it's a, a, a critic of um, two growth narratives, I guess. So one is about national economies that say, as long as the economy keeps growing, uh, the money uh, that the country is uh, is well run. So politicians should make sure that the economy keeps growing, which is of course impossible on a finite planet. Um, and so uh, you couldn't do that forever. But it's uh, it's been done for about 50 years now. This growth narrative, and uh, and we see that it's it stops working because the, the uh, planet is just uh, sustaining it less and less. The growth of our economic activity and on a smaller scale it's the um it's shareholder primacy uh which i'll talk about in a later slide so um i guess what degrowth does want is to get closer back to more to become reconnected with nature um so i don't know if this is a good slide for that because it's such a, a huge house but the idea of uh having our modern society, but staying connected and embedded in the nature of a planet, of the natural planet. And for instance, staying connected with the provenance of your food and um, make sure that you realize that food comes from uh, plants uh, and animals and, and not from uh, factories. And um, the other important message, I think, of degrowth is to just consume less, uh, buy less crap. And because through advertising, we've been told to always want more and consume more. And that when you when there's more prosperity in the Western world that we keep you know, spending the money that we earn, because why would you earn it if you don't spend it to keep this machine going and growing? And we also need, if we work at companies that produce stuff, then we need consumers and we're going to need more and more consumers if we're going to produce more and more uh, effectively. And um, the uh, um, money is also used as a social um, ladder that you can climb uh, and that sort of gamifies your career. So it's still considered um, uh, a very strong signal of success if you earn a high salary. And this is also used uh, to motivate people um, and uh, to make people work harder so that they can go higher in rank, sort of like how you can win at sports, you can win at the sort of the salary game. And um, that means that people will earn more and more money. And then, um, that implies that they're also gonna spend more and more money. And if you spend money, then that means you put other people to work and that you also make um, resources get used. So this cannot go on forever. If the, with the automation of industry, uh, production is gonna become more and more efficient and we're gonna use more and more stuff. Um, but the, there's a limit to how many, if you ha already have a super big TV set, then you don't need another one. And um, there was in the, if you look at movies from the, I guess it's the 50s or the 60s, you see that it's all about um, uh, young people who have cool cars, right? Like Greece, it's all about cars or these um, uh, Saturday Night Fever. Cars are very important. But if you look at um, uh, millennials, they're not all that interested in having really good cars. And um, the, uh, the signal of success that comes from having a big expensive car becomes less and less. And maybe now the signal of success is more how many Twitter followers you have, right? It's more important to people. And that is, I think, a good thing that we, uh, as our lives and our social lives get more, um, go into the internet, we use, we have, it reduces our physical impact. So we come sort of 
um, uh, more of our lives happens in the digital space. It uh, has less impact on the, the planet. Um, so talking about the other growth narrative, so that the big, the macro growth narrative is that politicians should make sure that the economy of a country grows or that the economy of a city grows, which means that like every, uh, there are like 50 small cities in Spain that all build an airport and a high tech campus, which then doesn't get used because, you know, the other 49 cities also build it and there's only uh, that many high tech companies to do. Um, to host, but just to try to um, uh, to grow and grow, and uh, everybody's trying to grow, and um, that happens at country level, at city level, and it also happens at company level. So individual companies have shareholders, and um, Milton Friedman in the 70s said, "Well, yeah, the best way to run a company is to only think about shareholder." value. So this is sort of the rational agent theory, like you can protect the environment if it increases the value of your brand for the shareholders. And, um, you know, some of it is translatable to, you know, brand value is an important signal where shareholders will want companies to be environmentally responsible, but it's, uh, it's still a, a disconnection between um, the decisions that get made by these shareholders or that the CEO of a company makes on behalf of the shareholders uh, and the impact on the planet that, uh, the, that you would want to have if you think about what is a good, I don't know, yogurt company. You, everybody has a, a feeling like that this, this would be a company I'd be proud to work for. And it's usually different from uh, only maximizing profit. So, um, Previously, we already saw that uh, money is a disconnection between the buyer and the seller. You know, if I do something for you and you pay me for it, that means uh, our relationship um, is completed and uh, I no longer owe you anything. Um, or you, sorry, you no longer owe me anything because you paid me. And we anonymized the, uh, that you had, uh, the, the credit I had with you now became a credit I have in terms of money. So it's, whenever you pay, any payment is a disconnection. It, it's like sort of hanging up the phone. It's disconnecting you from the people you, the person or the party you interacted with. And if you look at investment, uh, purely looking at shareholder value of a company where a team of people is trying to produce a result, it disconnects uh, the result from what the team would normally do because yeah, these shareholders, which don't even work at the company, um, get to decide like, oh, if option B gives us more profit, then let's take option B, even though it wouldn't be the, the better choice uh, if you take into account what economists call externalities, which is like, uh, you know, the environment and other impacts and uh, anything that uh, you don't measure in terms of uh, profit. And um, it's uh, even, this is even, goes even so far nowadays that if you have a pension, so you're saving up for a pension, you're, you're saving money into a pension fund, this pension fund invests in companies. And um, there's a, a, you would think that these investors in capitalist, capitalist investors in companies are all these rich people, but it's not their pension. A lot of it is pension funds for just ordinary people. So if you are saving up for a pension and you say, oh, I hope that when I'm 65, I have a, a lot of money to um, live my the, the third part of my life of, so I, I do want to have a, a good return on my pension investment, then it could well be that the rainforest gets destroyed to uh, make money in your name. So, um, and that a, a lot of people wouldn't even know that. Uh, how would you know? So um, there are more, more and more uh, sustainable banks like who, uh, say, if you put your money in our bank, your savings, then we'll make sure it only gets invested into sustainable uh, projects. Um, and there's, a, you see small parts of um, sort of conscious consumption and, and more conscious, like thinking about what the impact is of what you do. And um, that is, it's getting more and more. And so that's the, um, uh, the, the degrowth movement in a you could call you could bundle all that uh, all these 
uh, developments uh, with the term degrowth. So there is a lot happening for towards a more sustainable economy, um, but the underlying principles are still um, very disconnected. So if you think about it differently, like, like say, hey, I'm on this planet, I'm, I only have so much time, um, I, I want to do what I can, I don't want, yeah, I want to contribute something. And uh, say in my career, I have 80,000 hours to spend. What is the best impact I can have? You know, I have the time, I, I can do different things. I could build, uh, maybe the best thing I could do is help to build a rocket ship or help to build a, uh, a water well or no, help to build federated bookkeeping software. Uh, and, you know, you choose something that you think is uh, useful and you do what you can. And then um, you also take what you need. Um, and that is in, in degrowth thinking, you say, well, if I don't need it, then I'll uh, then it'd be bad to take it. If, so there's, it pushes back on this feeling of entitlement where you say, well, you know, I can pay for this. Uh, so if I have the money, then I'm entitled to it, but it's just um, uh, excessive to consume so much. So um, it's, uh, and it, it's less stressful in the end if you consume less. And there's, for instance, for food, there's only, you, you cannot consume more than a kilo of food a day. So there is a natural limit of how much you consume, uh, but you can consume uh, as many, you know, if you could get a second, second, electric car and you think oh i'm so environmental because i drive an electric car but then you know the lithium that gets mined for the batteries is still um being mined so uh this is a, a lithium mine somewhere in uh, i think it's in peru um so everything we consume uh has an impact on environment um and then another thought in this context is the uh, a lot of people say, well, maybe then we use a community currency where we are, or we buy locally. And um, that's, uh, of course, a, a beautiful thought because it reconnects you with your own local environment. And I think that's always good to get a more stable system and, and a peaceful society if there's more connections and less um, individualization. Um, but even local economic economic trade systems uh, are based on swapping and not on uh, sharing. So the next step is to really say, well, I just give away everything I produce and I, um, uh, well, you, you're going to need some security of money, but you say, well, I'll just see, uh, uh, I'll take what, I'll do what I can and I'll take what I need. And I don't swap, I just share. Uh, so the we of course have the, uh, we're sharing more and more, we're sharing cars and uh, with Airbnb, we're sharing um, houses. And um, even though these are then, these sharing platforms are again, uh, companies that use uh, shareholder privacy doctrine. So um, uh, it's, still, it's still driven by uh, capitalist investment, but there is more sharing and less, uh, Proper, exclusive property, I think, and it's a trend I think I see, maybe I just want to see it. So um, the idea of property is uh, very much related with money, of course, because you say this is mine, it means that I have the exclusive right to use this resource. Um, it's sometimes it feels very natural and, and even like children uh, say, well, this toy is mine so I can play with it. Um, but then even children also share their toys. And um, if you uh, think about, uh, for a lot of people, like wealth or prosperity or, um, or success is also in terms of how much you own exclusively and uh, you, you put a fence around it. So whatever is physically inside your fence is yours. And it's very clear that you're not allowed to cross the fence of somebody else's property because then you're trespassing. And that's just how we organize society. I guess a lot of it is inborn naturally. We do it naturally. Uh, if somebody puts uh, their towel on the beach, that's sort of their place. And that means that you cannot put sand on there because even though the beach is not theirs, it's like temporarily theirs because their towel is there. So we have all these signals. Um, but what I'm 
um, want to get to here is that so money and property are just data in the end. Um, we are, these are all signals and habits of how we interact. And there's nothing in the laws of physics that says if I put a fence around my garden, that then that is mine and I have exclusive use of it. Um, it's just a, a signal to other people saying it's a fence, so don't trespass. And with money, it's the same. So we used to have physical coins and physical banknotes, but nowadays most of the money is uh, transactions are electronic and there is still the same uh, sense of property, like what is in your bank account, even though it's digital, you own it. Um, and even if you own, uh, if there is Bitcoin in your wallet, then you own those Bitcoins and you have the exclusive right to use those, um, even though it's now electronic. So um, the, uh, the property, physical property uh, was maybe hard to change or to, uh, to change the habits around. But now that it's all electronic, maybe it becomes easier to start using money and uh, uh, property differently. So if you abstract, it becomes more abstract by being digital. And if you abstract it a little bit more, you can say that payment is not something fundamental of, it's not a, in, the, in the laws of physics, it's just persuasive data. So I'm giving you some numbers so we're moving numbers on the computers of our banks and by doing so i'm um persuading you to do something I'm, I'm talking to your brain saying work for me because i'm swapping numbers into your bank account and um if we know if we now see that there's these humans behaving on a planet and sort of above that is a cloud of data that uh puppeteers them we can reverse engineer how humans react to these uh, pieces of data. And um, we can make it better. We can nudge our habits in a, in a direction where we know it's gonna work better. So um, although money is agent, uh, sorry, money is ancient, money has been used for a very long time and it's very much ingrained in how we interact socially. I think we can do better now that it's, um, that money is all digital. And um, we can streamline these payment processes, and that happens a lot. And a lot of uh, fintech companies say, well, let's do micro payments, let's use more payments because payments are easier now. Um, but I think we should do the opposite. We should reconnect our value loops. So um, we sh because payments disconnect a buyer from a seller, a team from a product, a shareholder from the impact on the rainforest. Uh, now that money is digital, we can um, re-engineer it in a way so that uh, the, the people who get puppeteered by this data will behave in a more connected and harmonious way. So in FinTech, which is sort of the, um, digital technology around money, um, we're still focused on anonymous currency. So if Alice, um, uh, or in this case, if Bob has done something for Alice, Alice makes a payment through a bank um, and uh, that anonymizes, that sort of hangs up the phone in the relationship between Alice and Bob and they're, uh, they're done. And um, so people said, well, yeah, banks are bad and they're centralized and you know they spy on us and they control what we do and we are just puppets and the banks are the puppeteers. Let's do something libertarian and just use computers and cryptography to invent a great new world where everything will be better and then invented cryptocurrency, which is still a currency. It's still a means of payment. So if I use crypto, if I use Bitcoin to pay you for some service, then we're still anonymizing. I'm still hanging up the phone on our social relationship by saying the thing you owed, the favor you owed me uh, has been um, uh, converted into some number which the Bitcoin uh, network owes me and it's unrelated to you. So I might, I have anonymized or, or transferred our um, social uh, value into anonymous property. So cryptocurrency is still bubble technology. And I think a lot of um, uh, people see cryptocurrency as, oh, it's this new thing and it's better, but I think it's just, uh, it's still currency. So it's more of um, 
the old disconnecting um, technology. And one thing that does work better, I think, is if we say we, we'd have some way to um, connect across wider parts of our network so we can uh, coordinate with friends of friends. And for that, you would use multi-hop payments, which is sort of a subfield of uh, FinTech. So here you see a payment where Alice pays Bob, Bob pays Carol, Carol pays Diana, Diana pays Eric. And that way, even though Alice and Eric don't have a channel between them, they're allowed to pay each other. So if you want a successful payment network, then you say, oh, I become a node in the network. I'm not connected to every other node in the network, but there's always a multi-hop path between me and this other node. And this idea was first started, uh, first invented, I guess, by Ryan Fuger, who did a lot of work on um, these thoughts and also invented hash locks, uh, which are the cryptographic way of implementing uh, multi-hop payments. Very interesting theory. Uh, and if I go into that now, I'd go way over time. Uh, so Brian Fugger started Ripple. Ripple then added a uh, anonymous currency to this network. So they said, well, you can owe each other money or you can use XRP, which is this unique uh, anonymous currency. And then XRP became the successful part of Ripple. And uh, so the old, what, version without XRP is now known as Ripple Classic uh, or Rumple Pay. Um, but the project was revived, so to speak, at some point in the form of uh, Interledger, which is a multi-hop payment protocol, uh, which is also in its first version, I'll peak it, was about connecting different uh, cryptocurrencies together in its current version ILP4, it's more about micropayments and streaming payments. Um, but in both cases, uh, there is a problem with this uh, form of fintech, which is if you have a network of people um, like the uh, Errol paying, uh, Alice paying Eric, um, then the people in the middle will be considered uh, money transfer agents. So if you run a server, you install this open source in the ledger software, you install ILP kit on your server and you join a network and money throws through your server, then um, it, you will go to jail if somebody buys illegal goods with a payment that goes through your server. So that's a problem because um, payments are regulated. And although in um, you are allowed to mine Bitcoin because then you're very far away from the buyer and the seller that happen to do a transaction in the block you mine. Uh, you just mine the block that is for that timestamp and there's no direct relationship between you and the sender and the receiver of a payment. So that's why mining Bitcoin does not fall under money laundering um, uh, restrictions. But if you are a connector on the Interledger network, then um, the um, it's not entirely clear, but you could um, very reasonably expect your government to put you in jail if you didn't do the KYC uh, part of it. And that's, how, that's, how why, that's why Interledger nodes on the Interledger network now, they all do their KYC. So another approach that uh, I worked on previously is Ledger loops, where you don't consider a payment with a sender and a receiver, but you, you look at a loop of people in this um, narrative, it's uh, people around a tree and say, everybody wants to, do something for the person on their right and receive something from the person on their left. And so if that circle goes all around the tree, then you could do something for the person on your right and you get something back from the person on your left. And um, to make this work, you could use a hash lock, a cryptographic delivery receipt, which goes all the way around the tree. And if the delivery receipt reaches you, then you commit the transactions uh, by resolving, unlocking the hash lock and all the uh, transactions go through. Uh, so, um, since money is just persuasive data uh, and um, cryptocurrencies are still just currencies uh, that have this, this connection and multi-hub networks are hard to build because it's, uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved in running a node in, a, in, a, in such a network, uh, I think an interesting um, uh, way forward now for this uh, uh, for fintech is federated bookkeeping where we say we all have bookkeeping systems and we connect them together so we don't 
pay each other. We're not transferring payment. We're just keeping track of what we owe each other. And, um, and, and we improve the automation level of these bookkeeping systems and the way they interact. So for instance, you could use a bookkeeping system for your personal finance insights where you keep track uh, I guess everybody has a little, uh, either a piece of paper or an Excel sheet where they keep track of how much they spend on rent and how much is left for the holidays next year. Uh, you, as a group, you could have a local economic trade system where you say, well, I give you an hour of my time and then somebody else in the same neighborhood or city uh, gives me an hour of their time and this system keeps uh, track of that in a community currency. And um, if you have these bookkeeping systems, then you could at some point detect a loop, which is sort of the larger loops ideas where, um, for instance, the, the blue person at the bottom might be doing something for the green person and receiving something from the yellow person. Uh, and then at some point, if they have done that in a uh, circle, then you could use a settlement, which settles all these debts and say, well, I will settle, um, my debt. Uh, if I can settle my debt with the yellow person, then I'll um, uh, I'll cancel the debts that the green person has with me, and everybody does it at the same time, which is possible with a hash lock um, system. Then you uh, you you basically have been doing correspondent banking, so you've um, you are settling uh, the debts in the network. And if there's a closed system uh, of value, if you look at humanity as a closed system where value flows around, then these flows of value should always be decomposable into smaller circles, just like in um, electronic circuit theory. And if you keep settling these smaller circles, then the overall global flow will be a composition of um, debt settlement loops. Um, and the person itself is not acting as a money transfer agent. They're not transferring money for some other sender and receiver. They're just canceling their own debts and credits. Eventually you will need payment because you cannot always, there'll be some people who don't use the bookkeeping system and it will be useful to use money at the end. Um, but you could say, we're just gonna keep bookkeeping like um, uh, the guys I play squash with, we keep track each week of who paid for the beers and whoever is lowest in this uh, bookkeeping is the next person to pay. And we never settle because it's all just evens out by always uh, staying close to zero but you can always use payment in the case that it doesn't work anymore. So if your bookkeeping connection is your uh, bilateral credit relationship is bankrupt, then you say, oh, now you owe me 200 euros. So please just send me a bank transfer. And so payment becomes sort of the bankruptcy of the social uh, credit. That's sort of the vision that um, I hope we can reach with federated bookkeeping. Payments still exist, but they're not so central to the process anyway. So instead of making them more central in micropayments, we make them less. So we move them out uh, to the special cases where uh, where we need only where we really need it. And e-invoicing becomes much more uh, important part of the process. So e-invoicing is where you don't uh, send, print, send, and and then. Uh, register and uh, so, uh, import in accounts payable department and the other company has an accounts receivable department, you automate all of that. And an important um, European network that does that is Pebble. Uh, it's an e-invoice network. So the sender and the receiver are both registered through gateways and this allows them to send uh, invoices. And this is really, this network is growing um, I think most European governments are now part of it, which means that if you are a company doing B2G contracts for a government, you can also send your invoices via Pebble. And one of the projects we're doing is uh, similar to how Let's Encrypt made HTTPS free. Um, we are going to, instead of Let's Encrypt, we're gonna do the Let's Pebble project. Uh, so uh, at Pondosaurus, we are an earn to give company. We earn some money and our profits, We used to give away Pebble to people who want to use Pebble. Um, we are also improving Pebble because Pebble is open and it's great, but there is a, all the invoices get sent through gateways, through two gateways, a sending gateways and a receiving gateways, which you could interpret as a man in the middle. Uh, of course, the design of Pebble is, well, these gateways are what makes it safe, but 
they do have the power to read all the invoices you send and receive, and to they could even change them if they wanted to. So you have to trust these gateways a lot. So to re, to decentralize Pebble a little bit more, we invented uh, Pebble Direct. Then the Dutch Pebble Authority told us, well, you can't call that Pebble Direct because it bypasses us. So we, we renamed it to AS4 Direct. AS4 is the layer just below Pebble, where you have self-hosted identities like the web IDs you have in Solid. And um, through that, you can send an um, electronic invoice directly to the server, to the bookkeeping system um, of this other party without going through these gateways. And to make sure that the invoice is coming from the real company who is invoicing you, you could still use a certificate chain where uh, they have their own certificate, but they had this certificate signed by the um, by a certified Pebble gateway. So they have the trust, but they don't have the route of going through these gateways. Um, and uh, the uh, another a project that we got funded from by NLNet is to implement Pebble in Nextcloud, um, which is an exciting project that we're working on now. Another thing is we're doing in this um, area is billing API integrations, where you have a, a you can automate how you receive your bills from Amazon or GitHub, except etc. And then we want to integrate this with bookkeeping systems like you know, FreshBooks and QuickBooks and all these bookkeeping systems that are online and have an API. And that's how we want to arrive at sort of micro bookkeeping instead of um, micro payments. Um, um, I'm gonna skip through this part a little bit. So uh, logistics could be automated more if you have better bookkeeping. Uh, I guess that thought is kind of obvious, like the more machine readable business documents we have um, that we could collaboratively compose the invoices, we could uh, automate supplier credit, uh, automatic orders. So if my, if the shop bookkeeping system sees that the shelves are empty, then automatically this triggers production in the, uh, in the factory. And um, another thing you could do is crowdfunding where uh, you keep track of uh, people send signed messages saying, yes, I will crowdfund your project. And then you can see if you have enough messages that you can start the production, and then it starts to look like a virtual organization with federated bookkeeping. So a virtual organization is um, uh, an organization that lives among multiple hosts. So um, the if you have a federated computer system, then you could have the resources from different uh, members of this federation uh, put together and um, uh, uh, into a new virtual organization, which is not um, an, a, a closed separate unit by itself. So the thing we're excited about and the question we started asking us if, a few weeks ago, we have this weekly brainstorm call um, for federated bookkeeping, um, is what would happen if you add federated bookkeeping to virtual organizations? So people do condition, conditional commitments and um, through those commitments, you can have group coordination. So um, you organize, if you say, I'll do this and somebody else, I'll do that. And you, everybody can see if we have all the components that we need. And that means that we don't need a top-down organization. People can just offer things that they see are still missing. And uh, you can collaboratively get to uh, all, get all the pieces of the puzzle together and uh, and organize. And then you could have algorithmic triggers uh, whenever a consensus is reached. So this is obviously what um, DAOs, uh, distributed autonomous organizations do on blockchain and what uh, Ethereum made very popular with smart contracts. But there it's still based on uh, a cryptocurrency. And we think you could do the same in a federated computer system where you send messages to each other. So um, yeah, that's sort of my summary of, of the vision for federated bookkeeping that we have now. We only just started. There's a um, Gitter channel called federated bookkeeping uh, slash community. Uh, I'll put the links in the, um, in the Zoom chat in a minute. And we have a website from where you can also find this, uh, uh, this Gitter channel. And we have a weekly call on Thursday morning. So we had it, it just finished when this talk uh, started. It's, uh, 
uh, uh, on Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Uh, Amsterdam time. And uh, there we just brainstorm. It's usually five or six people there. And it's um, a fun chat about what could be if we use federated bookkeeping instead of using money. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to unmute. Couldn't find the button. Uh, it was extremely e difficult to defocus in this lecture because there was so much uh, <laughs> uh, information, ideological information, and uh, so happy to, to see that one can be as expert programmer as I know you are from working <laughs> together since last year and still have a value system for life, which is uh, different from um, getting the big post with the big money and moving fast into management positions. Uh, I guess there are uh, a lot of nice e, um, subjects for discussion. So please uh, let me try to um, see how I can see your hands there, even you are. Uh, we have Giuseppe. Please go ahead. Giuseppe. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, thought provoking lecture. Uh, and on an old subject, money. <clears throat> I would like to ask you how you get, usually when uh, you, uh, you, have, you deal with money, there are two issues. One is trusting the system. So how do you get participants to trust your system and thinking that maybe one night uh, it doesn't disappear? And the other question is the tax man. Governments like to collect taxes anyhow, in any shape or form you do business activity. So what is your reaction to those things? Yeah, so uh, two good questions. So um, for trust, um the uh it's it's a better story i think than for for instance cryptocurrencies or than for uh centralized systems so if you use a centralized server um then you have to trust that that server doesn't go away and you have to trust that uh the people who maintain this server uh will keep maintaining it in your interest and uh if you have a blockchain um, cryptocurrency, then you have to trust that there will be as not uh, enough people who keep using this currency. And if I use um, Dogecoin, then maybe next year, nobody is interested in Dogecoin anymore and then my uh, stored value is worth nothing. Um, but with federated bookkeeping, the trust is uh, you define, you have your own bookkeeping system, uh, which is entirely sovereign. So um, you, we assume that you already have a bookkeeping system. So uh, companies need to uh, are physically uh, fiscally obliged to have a uh, bookkeeping system, and other people will probably even if it's just a scrap of paper, you have some sort of bookkeeping system uh, which you already trust, and then um, you can send messages and you can sign these messages, and then this message is just worth. Uh, how much the recipient of the message trusts you. Uh, so the only thing the system needs to secure is that if it looks like the message came from some person, that it's actually uh, did come from that person and there's no uh, room, there's so the computer security of uh, uh, that you don't get imposters, etc. cetera. And um, that's pretty um, basic in theory with uh, cryptography. And of course, the execution is um, uh, is just computer security. But for instance, in the Pebbel network, there is there are authorities that check the company res registers, that check that um, you are who you say you are um, when you send an invoice. It's actually coming from this legal entity. And uh, in the system we propose with the self-hosted identities, uh, AS4 Direct, there you can always check the public key of the sender on their website. And as long as you trust that their website wasn't hacked, then you know for sure that the invoice came from this person. And as with regards to tax, um, yeah, there is the, the same 
uh, tax obligations keep applying. Um, and um, you, there could be a movement of where, where the governments would say, well, you have your bookkeeping more automated now, so we just want a backdoor into your system. Um, but that would be the same as when they come to audit your unconnected bookkeeping system. So that doesn't really change there. So there's no um, uh, separate, there's no anonym, we don't add anonymity, like Bitcoin adds anonymity, which enabled things like Silk Road. Um, but in federated bookkeeping, that's not the case. You're just sending message that, messages to people who you already do business with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think trust is a, is a major um, ideological issue and a major difficulty in general can be tempo, I mean, impossible, not impossible to change, but still it is one of those things that take time. I would see that like yesterday you said, the ideas of solid, they are not there yet to overtake, I don't know, the business model of uh, Facebook and uh, they don't allow us to bo book a plane ticket yet today and, or other applications we need. It's also um, these concepts of sharing instead of swapping or just paying and cutting the bridges of uh, relationships with each other. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm a camera is off. Uh, are, require time to develop because um, evolutionary psychologists, I um, were giving a lecture, academic training lecture two years ago before COVID and saying uh, that um, even in um, prehistoric times, people wanted to, to safeguard and own their cave and they didn't want to, to share. Therefore, the image you showed with the fence and uh, the convention that money is a convention and property is a convention. It is true, it is a convention, but um, it is really well rooted today, <laughs> today for sure. Yeah, it will, it will take a, a long time to change that. But I do think things are changing already in society uh, about how we consume. And a lot of yeah. people are consuming less. A lot of people eat less meat because they know it has such a high environmental impact, even though maybe previously they would have thought, well, I have the money, so I might as well spend it on what I want to have. Um, so, um, uh, but yeah, we, I don't think we can really speed up those uh, processes in society, but we can just create the uh, computer systems that will be needed, hopefully be needed in 20 years from now when, um, when people think more about their ecological impact and less about shareholder value. Um, and so, yeah, for the project, we, we the main uh, core of the project now is just six people talking. We cannot hear you. you are, we have some interruption in uh, both sound and image, Michiel. Can you hear me? Gosh, I think Zoom didn't like the new pro proposal for a new business model. <laughs> so we lost the speaker. Here you are. We uh, lost. Yeah. You. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. There was a network uh, inter uh, interruption. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. So, the, so um, we 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 understand stood up to the point that you said, indeed, of course, we need to prepare the technical ground with the appropriate software and the, the number of people you were already developing actively in the federated book, bookkeeping project. And then we couldn't hear anything. Maybe I should stop my camera because maybe Um, it is the same problem again. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'll I'll try to uh, to continue now. Um, 
Yeah, so we're brainstorming once a week on Thursday morning about what we should build and um, then um, we'll do experiments and build systems. And for now, the main focus is on e-invoicing because that could be the basis to connect these systems. Yeah. Look, um, you have, we have again third time this problem. Can you add it uh, from where your uh, goods come from? And um, maybe settle, uh, circular debt settlement. Yeah, that was a partially past. Uh, Giuseppe's hand is risen. Do you want to say something else or you forgot it, Giuseppe? I did not have any other questions. Uh, oh. I, I kept my hand raised, but I, I have nothing else to add. Thank Fantastic. you. Okay. So because we have these interruptions in the video transmission and they will be shown also in the recording, which will be a pity and damage our beautiful entry in the in the CDS, what I promise is that I will put all of these links about the federated bookkeeping and the guitar chat and the meetings every week in our Indico event for, for people to, to join if they wish. And uh, unless you have something else from the audience that you would like to say now, um, I would then uh, just thank the speaker. That is a pity because the discussion would be interesting for half an hour, but I think that somehow we have uh, network problems to see and hear me here at this moment. I don't know what's going on. Do we have any other questions now? Okay. If not, uh, Definitely you can continue in the guitar chat and definitely Michiel replies um, very quickly. And thank you very much for joining. The video will be ready real soon now, linked from the event. And I shall also publish in the coming weeks the lectures on YouTube. This does not depend only from me, it depends also from the same social media um group so thanks again thanks Michiel for saying yes thanks for everyone for joining and uh, october starting soon we have an incredible academic training lectures program this week just go to the indico category and see what is coming up a uh, very intense program thanks very much for for your participation Goodbye. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye now. Cheers.